in this video i'm driving another australian peculiarity it is a 1970 morris nomad now what on earth is a 1970 morris nomad well ladies and gentlemen the um the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that the morris nomad pays more than a passing resemblance to an austin 1100 bmc 1100 if you like it appeared in many different forms and uh, you'd be absolutely right uh, it is an australian assembled morris 1100 really but with some big big changes uh, we've got a different front end treatment and a bonnet bulge and the bonnet bulge is because the um, sister car to this nomad is the 1500 so that's a morris or austin 1100 but with the 1500 cc e-series engine from a maxi we gave it a different front end treatment with these um, Heller lamp units so it was a bit of a facelift but the bonnet bulge is needed because the um, e-series engine is quite a tall engine uh, also made the maxi look rather ugly maybe they should have just put a bonnet bulge on the maxi and lowered the bonnet line it could have been a solution and we've got the, the Morris badge here but this grill all very bespoke all, all very Australian but of course Perhaps the most interesting stuff starts happening around the back because this is a hatchback or is it an estate or is it somewhere in between the two who can say it certainly has a hatchback and uh, it also has an automatic badge for reasons we'll get into in a moment because already there might well be people screaming that this doesn't have an e-series engine patience patience we will get there but this was British Leyland in its earliest days, coming up with a design tailored for the Australian market, but developed in the UK. There are pictures of prototypes. If you go to the excellent aronline.co.uk website, you can see some of the um, original um, prototypes, which have different door handles. These door handles were legislated by requirements here in um, Australia. So they're a nice pull handle like so it wasn't a huge success the morris nomad uh, i think they sold around 30,000 of them um, so this is quite a rare car it's believed there are currently only 15 of these on the road which is um, a, a terrifyingly low survival rate to be honest so i just had to wait for this stupidly big um ford f450 to um, park about the way let's have a nose under the bonnet i think uh, i think we need to see what's going on under here uh, lovely accessories going on here with the um, wind deflector and the um, sunscreen, sun visor, if you will. Uh, bonnet release, I imagine, should be under here. Yep, there we go. Uh, ignore that, we'll come back to that. Right, Let's see if we can find our way in. Uh, pop the bonnet. There we go. So here is our old friend, the A series engine, and that's because. At the time of this car's conception, they didn't have an automatic gearbox on the E-Series engine. The Allegro did get one, but um, it was still being developed. So this is, it would have been a 1275. Um, there's the Moog, but with the Australia outline. Um, that's the um, engine arm, if you like, of BMC. I think that's a, a hangover from the um, pre-BMC days, to be honest, because Morris tended to do the engines even though this a series is an austin engine it's a very confusing point um google it and uh, you can you can also be confused the a series engine stepping down to an ap automatic four speed gearbox underneath which runs in the sump uses the engine oil and somehow works um, no one else has ever thought that was a good idea um, but ap transmissions managed it and uh, it does sort of work so that's all of the good side mounted radiator of course um, as per the original Isagonis spec on the 1100 and it seems quite a tiny radiator but it does somehow manage to keep fairly cool the downside is it pumps all the heat out through this wheel arch and when you're sitting in the passenger seat which I was earlier it gets quite warm um, but there you go uh, that screen wash reservoir down here it's all looking very good because um, this engine has been recently rebuilt and it's been up spec'd as well so it's actually a 1380cc engine 
Um, it's got a sports exhaust on it. Um, I don't know if it's a Meteor carburetor or one with just bigger jets. I can see minispares.com down here. So that's going on. It's got a brake booster, which I don't think it would have had, um, or servo, um, when new. A tiny little dipstick down here, which is a bit hot to touch at the moment. Distributor right where the rain can hit it. All good. So it's um, quite a potent little motor, really. We'll put the bonnet back down again. There we go. And we'll turn our attention inside. So first of all, we've got a bench seat because Australians like bench seats. But it'd be a bit cozy with um, six up in a Nomad. Uh, one curious thing is it's still got a BMC steering wheel. Uh, perhaps they just had a new stock because um, BMC ceased to exist in 1968 with the formulation of the British Leyland Motor Company, uh, which co combined even more companies together. We've got a strip speedometer, simple fuel and temperature gauge. Over here, we've got um, wipers, one speed, a couple of warning lights and the ejector seat, which I'm reliably formed is actually the screen wash. Yeah, no, no ejector seat, no hole in the roof, so it's all good. Uh, some visors do have a habit of falling down. They're quite a simple design, actually. <laughs> and I, I, I suspect that, oh yes, yeah, a broken plastic clip. Uh, so that's broken with time. But uh, we've got um, an original BMC um, transistor radio, although it's been um, reprogrammed. It's now clever and electronic and um, isn't firing up at the moment, but it, it, you can plug your iPod in. It's quite good. Yeah, we've got hazard lights. There's no um, warning flasher, but there we go. We, we can tell they're on. Uh, there's a mobile phone mount that someone's added. There is sort of a heater, but there is no heater fan. So um, you have to be moving for any heat to come into the car. Uh, so excuse the, that, that's a later design of LDV van, which has some shared heritage with this vehicle, believe it or not. Um, albeit only the name, they're now Chinese built. We've got a row of extra gauges, voltmeter clock, and oil pressure sensible additions to be honest light switch is there uh, assume it's a foot operated dip switch maybe or is it on the stalk oh no stalk stalk um dip switch that's quite good uh, we've got a choke control under here uh, to apply as needed tiny pedals and look even the brake pedal is still tiny they didn't fit a big fat um brake pedal which to be honest is annoying they've just used the manual one and um, I like a wider pedal because I like to left foot brake with my hideous sandaled feet. Uh, moving over here, we have the four speed gear selector, which isn't the traditional pattern. You start in neutral, reverse is up, and then it's one, two, three, four, and D. I'm not really sure what the point of four is because four is D. Uh, maybe four holds it in fourth, I don't know, but obviously you can manually select the different gears. And um, uh, yeah, We'll get to the gearbox once we start driving, but all locally produced vinyl in here, classic um, Leyland door handles and um, window winder, static seat belts, and um, yeah, you adjust them down here. These still got the BMC logo on as well. They obviously had some stocks left over, but I think it's probably time to have a look in the back. Now, um, where is Agonis's design of front wheel drive transversely mounted really wins? is um, in terms of rear space, because the, there's no transmission tunnel per se. There, there is a bit of a panel, but I think that's more for strength than anything else. There's no prop shaft, so that's quite low. And uh, because there's no rear axle to drive in the traditional sense, the seat can be lower. There's actually decent amount of space for my hideous knees. And uh, we've got a little ashtray here, should you feel the need. Simple little grab handles also seen in minis and windows that go all the way down because we've got a little fixed quarter light here. So that's quite good. We've got a little interior light. Oh, it even works. Brucey bonus. But yeah, it's actually really spacious here. And um, unlike the 1100s, I've got extra glass behind me as well, because that would normally be a filled in panel um, on the 1100 saloons and the 1500 saloon indeed. Um, but um, yeah, decent view of the road ahead. Uh, I'd say that's quite good. We're here in St Kilda, south of Melbourne at the moment. Um, got a parcel shelf attached to the rear seat. Rear seat does fold. We should probably investigate that. Right, here we go then. 
pull the seat forward and we're in. And uh, I don't know what holds the back in place, so we're going to find out in a minute. Uh, I don't know. We'll go and look in the boot. But as you can see, you've got extra storage space under here for all your nice things. Um, oh, I've moved the seat back, haven't I? That's probably what's causing the issue here. Um, so, yeah, it's like original um, workshop manual. So, 1500 overhead cam, the E series engine, or 1300 automatic. And uh, it's a lovely document. Oil filter components. Uh, take your engine apart. Wonderful stuff. Uh, so yeah, use, useful to have. Let's go and have a look in the back. And uh, here we get, go. We've got gas struts, which actually slot into this area here, out of the way. Apparently they don't do that on a Maxi. We've got very similar, fairly ugly, exposed um, hinges going on at the top and no heated rear window, I noticed. But there is an interior light. Oh, it even works. There we go. I don't think that's standard fare. Um, but yeah, decent sized boot. Can get a fair bit in, really. And uh, there's an extra panel under here for the spare wheel. Uh, you have to unscrew it, in fact, so we won't be doing that, but that's what is there. Um, what does that do? Ah, that gives us our folding rear seat. It's very solid metal um, tray. And uh, you can have it in that position, or if you want to protect it, you can fold it up to protect um, the uh, inner workings. Uh, apparently you can fold it the other way and make a bed, um, but I'm not sure how you do that, and I don't want to break anything. Um, but there you can see the uh, mechanism that's operated. So that bar locks into this position here. So it's the actual parcel tray itself that holds the rear seat up Ahem. oh gone too far and there we go that should be locked in place again that's really quite handy and down with the seat base practical motoring now it must be said it's a little ungainly i think but nonetheless um, this is one of the earliest forms of a hatchback super mini really ahead of the fiat 127 renault 5 um, even the auto bianchi i think which was arguably the first hatchback maybe it was the same year 1969 but this is particularly odd because it came into production the same year as the maxi so really they made the decision not to build the maxi in australia but to try and make the 1100 more like a maxi a slightly odd choice i feel but um, I think we've done enough talking, we should probably get on with the driving. Naturally, it's still got hydroelastic suspension. Uh, it is raised. They use a spacer at the back to um, raise it up a bit at the back so it doesn't just squat down when you put a load in the boot. Right, we'll get you set up, get away from this noisy, noisy place and go for a drive. Right, Dinsdale the Nomad. Let's see if you'll fire up. There we go. Dinsdale is the name given to this car by its owner, Kathy. So, um, hello, Kathy. Uh, I haven't met Kathy. Um, she's had to work today. So, um, yeah, here I am driving your car. I hope you approve. Uh, I shall apply some ejector seat. Oh, wow. That's um, certainly a fair bit of screen wash coming out of one jet. Apply the wipers and look at that. Uh, that's a considerable overlap going on and oh, considerable sirens as well it really is the most exciting day i've got water dripping off the um, sun visor due to the power of the screen wash that's not a usual thing got a fairly big triangle here but good overlap no triangle of doom um, quite an interesting wiper pattern nonetheless blades park in front of the passenger sorry the driver and they do they swapped it over on the 1100s for left hand drive um, but that's enough wiper waffle Let's get driving. Into drive. Handbrake is to my right. And uh, I must warn you, Dinsdale is um, so named because Dinsdale is noisy. Uh, there is a sports exhaust going on, but uh, not what you can hear as we just pootle around at low speed coming out of this car park because I don't want to run anyone over. But at least they can hear us coming quite convincingly. 
I think we'll go that away. I'm going to check the cyclists. Thank you very much, sir. In your Skoda Octavia. So it's a very clever gearbox because um, automatic gearboxes don't usually work with engine oil. The AP transmissions managed to make that work and uh, surprisingly well as well, as we shall discover. Uh, as soon as these lights change, which they now have, Into second, into third, into fourth, and we're not even at 30 miles an hour yet. That's 30. So I think it's fair to say that overall gearing is not particularly tall. Uh, these cars are not great motorway cruisers. Uh, they were always rather better at driving around town. I have to watch which tiny pedal I'm pressing here. I'm going to give up with left foot braking because it's too difficult given how small the brake pedal is. But yeah, that's a downshift. There's another one. So we're into second again. That's very unusual automatic transmission behaviour for the 1960s. But certainly quite perky. And uh, of course you've got all the other wonderful Isagonis hallmarks that made these cars uh, the basic 1100, uh, one of the best selling cars in Britain during the 1960s. They sold loads of them. And that's because you got nice steering, it's unassisted but nicely weighted um, and quite direct. It kind of handles like a bigger, more refined Mini. Oh, yeah, Dinsdale rocks. Dinsdale will get a shift on. The servo means my pedal pressure is fairly light to bring us back down to a, a stop again. So yeah, a joyous little car to drive, but again, I think it falls foul of um, the British just not really getting a handle on what the Australians wanted. bit of slippage there. That is kind of one of the problems. It was never the most robust transmission because yeah it was trying to work really hard working in the sump of the engine which means the oil temperatures can be fairly high at times as well. So uh, yeah they have the work cut out these um, little gearboxes. But it's a nice upright driving position. I know some people criticize it for the um, angle of the steering wheel but I don't find that problematic it kind of falls nicely to hand it isn't too vertical but the ride is really very good indeed for a little car um, unlike the rubber suspension of the Mini the um, Nomad has the benefit of that hydroelastic suspension which we've seen already on this trip we saw it in the um, Kimberley oh it Dinsdale does drone a bit at speed so basically it's a fluid and rubber displacer on each corner linked front and rear which means as the front hits a bump the rear rises to level it out so you don't get pitching and you certainly don't get the bounce that you get in a mini this is a charming little car, but it is very much a town car. It's, uh, yeah, I suppose you bought a Kimberley if you wanted to go further afield. But excellent visibility. I've got opening quarter lights here in the front as well. Uh, this is um, good stuff. I can't believe I'm driving a Morris Nomad around in, um, oh, I'm going to go this way, in the... Uh, Australia. This is um, quite exciting. Just really nice steering. So much better than um, a lot of contemporaries. It's a lot sharper. 
As we go over the tram tracks, we hear them, we don't really feel them. We feel quite little next to, next to this um, enormous truck. Dinsdale. Eighty kilometers an hour allowed. Oh, Dinsdale's flying. That was a bit rude, Mr. Camry. Yeah, she cruises. He, he, she. Cruises quite nicely. There's a limit to how far we want to go down this road. Well, there we go. That was the um, fascinating Morris Nomad with the 1.3 engine and automatic gearbox. Uh, a very charming, if somewhat curious car. We'll just have another look at the back end again, just in case you can't quite believe it. Um, yeah, it's it's great. I love I love it. It's such an oddball and uh, but but a good one as well it's um not the best ever automatic transmission it's not the best ever car but they're really really joyous to drive um they just um do the job so well and this one's got the added practicality of being a hatchback estate type thing so that makes it pretty extraordinary uh it's a shame this came near the end for british leyland uh, there would be um, only a few more years 1974 it was kind of all over and that's a shame because it put a stop to crazy things like this so i hope you've enjoyed the video um, don't forget to subscribe before you go don't forget you can go to the hubnut store don't check out the mighty dacha road trip um, on my channel if you haven't already and i shall see you in a future video farewell